Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today I'm going to take a look at one of the topics that was requested uh, in the feedback uh, video that I did and the comments that y'all gave me. So today what I want to look at is maintenance for model locomotives. And we're going to take a look at several different types of uh, common uh, locomotives, commonly available, Atherin, Lifelike, and Atlas. So let's go ahead and get started. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Now, in one of the uh, one of the feedback comments that I got. Someone asked to do one on locomotive maintenance and also suggested that take a look at Lifelike because they're fairly inexpensive, easy to get at uh, train shows and the like, as well as Atherin. They're very similar to Atherin. So uh, what we're going to do today is I've got a couple of Lifelike models out here and also a, uh, an Atherin model. And I also pulled out a couple of Atlas because they're also very common and have been in use for a long time. And uh, they you know, they make some very good models, particularly the Cato-based uh, RS-11, RS-3 uh, series locomotives. You know, I just love those things and run, run them to death. So let's go ahead and get started and take a look at various of these models. So I'm going to zoom in down here on the bench top and we'll start. Now what I have here is a lifelike BL2. These were produced oh, mid-90s. Uh, mid sometime in that time period, 95 to 97. And, um, and later they, they continued to make these, but that's when they de debuted them. They were called a BL2. The BL stands for branch line. So they were designed to be used on branch line operations. So they could be used for freight or they could be used for passenger uh, operations. So let's take a look at the chassis for these. And I want to look at this one here first. If we Compare it to an Atherin locomotive, you can see this is the Atherin flat can and flywheels and the whole nine yards. They look almost identical. Matter of fact, they are so close that these parts are interchangeable with the Atherin and vice versa, which is a good thing because you can't get parts for the lifelike anymore, but you can still get parts for Atherin. So you can actually, even the side frames uh, on the trucks can be swapped out because they just are a perfect fit for one another. They are fairly easy to maintain locomotive. So I want to go over the steps uh, for these and also we'll take a look at a couple of others here. But before we get started with that, I want to show you something right here. Let me zoom in just a bit so you can see this. I've got two decoders that I used in these and both of these are very unique decoders. You've probably never heard of these. These were produced by NCE when they were called North Coast. And what this was, was a kit. You could buy this board with this chip right here already installed and all these other components came separately. And then you had to put it together yourself. But it was a fairly inexpensive way to get a bunch of decoders. And these lasted, oh, from about 1995 and the the date here on the chip is 95, uh, but they were, in, they were in production from about 95 uh, into 1997, so two, two and a half years, something like that. And they finally stopped making them when the actual cost of a factory complete decoder became less than the cost of the kit. So that's when they discontinued them. And I've tested it. These things actually still work. So they're a, a, they were a very nice, interesting little kit, but NCE was the only company that did these to, that I know of. I don't know of any other kit type decoders. So that's just a unique thing. I wish I had found this in time uh, to include it in the video I did on decoders. But um, unfortunately, I just ran across this the other day. So let's go ahead and talk about 10 easy things that you can do in order to keep your locomotive properly maintained and running for years and years. As far as maintenance, you should keep a regular log of your locomotives and, you know, approximately how much runtime they accumulate. 
and uh, figure on uh, regular maintenance of at least once a year for your locomotives, particularly those that are run on a regular basis. You might be able to get away with a little bit longer intervals for locomotives that don't get run a lot. But basically though, I recommend going through these 10 steps whenever you buy a new locomotive and are ready to put it into use. Uh, particularly though, when you buy a pre-owned locomotive, because you know nothing about the history of it, how often it was run or anything. So you need to be able to take a look at uh, the guts and see if it's in good shape. You should also plan on doing this anytime you take a locomotive out of storage and plan to put it into use. And also when you're going to install a decoder in a locomotive, because um, you never know and you wanna make sure that the locomotive is in good running condition. Because the last thing you wanna do is put a decoder in here, put it on the track, start it up, and have it, uh, have it seize on you and burn up your decoder. So basically it's a fairly easy thing. These are fairly 10 easy steps uh, that can prevent that kind of problem. The first thing, uh, I want to uh, mention is the crack gear problem. And as I've shown you in previous videos, uh, and I'll put a link uh, above me here to uh, a video I did on this problem and how to fix it. Uh, these uh, gears right in here, let me pull one out. There we go. So if you look at this, you can see there's a little black plastic spacer here between the two halves of the axles. And that electrically isolates the left and the right side and allows for power pickup to be done fairly simply. Uh, the problem with these is they crack over time. And when they do crack, you'll start to hear uh, snapping sounds or clicking sounds in the locomotive as it's running. And that's something you always have to look out for when you buy a new locomotive, one of these used ones like this. Uh, and these, this uh, system is still used on the Athern Ready to Roll locomotives. It's used on Walther's uh, Proto Series locomotives. Uh, Bachmann uses some of these and various other companies. I think Hornby in the UK actually uses some of these split axle type setups. And they will crack over time. There's just stress lines in the plastic that will uh, allow it to crack over time because the two pieces of these axles have to be pushed into the center of that um, of that uh, piece of plastic and it puts it under a lot of pressure and that will eventually over time fail. And you can hear it, the, the locomotive will start to slip, the gears will start, will start to get out of uh, uh, proper orientation and you'll hear that snapping and popping cracking sound as the loco moves. So you need to listen for that the first time you're, and, and particularly with the older lifelike and any older Atherton locomotives and any of the Walther's locomotives that use these. I did a video on this problem previously and showed how to go about fixing it. But one thing I wanna point out, uh, you can get these uh, replacement uh, gears, as I said in the video, and I gave you a link, uh, or I gave you information on the, the part number for these. You can also get replacements through uh, Shapeways. There's a fellow named Ken Rickman, and he has a uh, shop on Shapeways.com where you can buy 3D printed versions of these. So you can you can check those out. And uh, like I said, it's DK Rickman's shop at Shapeways.com, and I'll put that in my uh, in the description for this video. Video. He makes these for the Athern standard Athern locomotives for the uh, uh, lifelike PAs and uh, also for some of the Bachmann uh, locomotives that uh, use these. So take a look at that, and they work fine in, in the lifelikes, okay? Now, and matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he designed them for the lifelikes. Now, another thing that I have done more recently, before I found Ken's uh, site, I took some of these that were cracked and cleaned them thoroughly, washed them with soapy water and a toothbrush and got as much of the grease off as I could, dried them, and then went over them again with isopropyl alcohol to degrease them. And then what I, and I did the same thing to the axles themselves. And then I, uh, I, I put a Loctite gel super glue into the center of this plastic gear axle piece. And then I quickly inserted the two halves, the two wheels with its short axle into the opening and got them in place and set them to the proper uh, 
distance, space it. Uh, just as quickly as I could, you don't want to use a fast setting super glue. Get the slow setting kind. That gives you time to adjust the spacing. And what that did was, is it, for one thing, it cemented the inside of this plastic piece to the actual, met uh, to the actual metal axles. And it also, I think, uh, squeezed some super glue up into the crack and filled that in. And I did that on some uh, lifelike PAs and they're running fine now. So it worked for me, uh, but I don't have a long history with it, so I don't know how long it's gonna last. And I'm gonna be ordering some of Ken Rickman's uh, version for the PAs, just in case. Okay, so that was the first thing that you can do as far as maintenance goes. Now, another thing that I recommend, particularly when you get a new locomotive or buy a used one, any of that kind of thing, but also periodically when you do your maintenance, check your wheel spacing. And um, that can be very important in preventing uh, uh, derailments at frogs and, and uh, going through turnouts, that kind of thing. So what you want to do is, this is an NMRA Mark III uh, standards gauge. And it comes in a package like this. I'm sure it looks very different now. This one is probably 30 years old. And they're probably up to a Mark V version, but I don't know. Uh, this cost me $250 many years ago. At any rate, they have various notches and, and spots on here that allow you to uh, check the gauges on turnouts and all kinds of things. But what's important is right here on this side, next to my thumb, there's two little notches and they're set for the flanges on your axles. So all you have to do is put that right there over the flanges and if they pop in there, then it's perfectly gauged or, or spaced. And you wanna make sure of that. Now, and this is what you would use to check the spacing when you're doing that repair uh, with the super glue, because you don't want those things too close together. And you can adjust the spacing by simply, you know, just rotating them a little bit and getting them back in here together. And you can see this one hmm, needs to go in just a touch more. Okay, there. So they should both drop into those little notches right there in the, uh, in the side of that. So that's how you check that. Very, very easy, but something that's very important to do. And you can also use this on your rolling stock. Particularly if you've got a car that's regularly derailing, check the, the spacing on the flanges. Okay, so that's number two. Now, as far as other things, number three. Now, another thing you really should do for good, uh, proper operation is regularly clean your wheels. And I've shown previously how to do that with uh, a, a paper towel uh, laid on the track and uh, run it with a, a type of cleaning fluid. I still use isopropyl alcohol, but there's lots of other cleaning fluids uh, uh, available that you can use for cleaning your wheels. But it's important to be able to do that. And it's very simple as I've shown in the previous video. And I'll include a, a link to that video above me here. And uh, it's fairly straightforward as far as keeping these clean. You can also just take a cotton swab dipped in some kind of cleaner, whatever you choose to use, and run that along the tread to get it clean. And that's something you should do because as I've told you in the past, electrical pickup is very, very important when it comes to uh, DCC. And the best way to improve electrical pickup is keep your wheels on your locomotives clean and keep your track clean. And those two things will work together to give you good, reliable operations. Now, another thing to do is check for lint buildup because you'll be surprised how much lint and other kinds of fibers end up getting up into the trucks and into the wheels here. And that stuff will build up around in here and it can literally prevent uh, free movement of your wheels uh, laterally and also it can uh, eventually cause them to bind if you've got a really dirty uh, a situation and it's building up a lot. Now it's also very important on locomotives that have pickups like these right here that I'm pointing to where they either um, are attached to the uh, to the wheel uh, at some point or where they rub against the back of the uh, wheels themselves, and in some cases on the top of the wheels. And lint will build up in those places and prevent good electrical pickup. So all you have to do, you can run a toothpick or something down in there and clean it out. 
Uh, you might be able to, uh, if you can, on, if it's on the back side, you can put a Q-tip in there or you can use a pipe cleaner to get down in there with some cleaner and get that uh, lint and other grunge that builds up on those electrical contacts, get that cleaned out of there and that will help your locomotive performance. Let's go on and move on to the next one. Now another thing you'll see right here on the ends of the truck tower where this worm gear housing is, there is a bronze bearing in here. You can see a shaft and then there is a bronze bearing. There's two of those. There's one here and there's one right in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to lubricate these bearings because they will dry out over time and you can end up with them freezing on you. This is a medium weight oil made specifically for uh, use with model uh, locomotives, model uh, cars, electric cars, those kind of things, uh, radio control cars, anything that needs a light oil. Be careful what you use. Do not use something that is not plastic compatible. But basically, all you have to do is right here, put a drop of oil on this bearing, like that, and then come around to the other side of the gear tower and fit it in right in here and drop a drop of oil in here because there is a bearing in there as well. Okay, then we're going to do it at the other end. Okay, you can see that one right there. And I'm going to put a drop of oil right on that bearing. Doesn't take a lot. Okay. And give it a good spin. And right in here, there is an opening between the shaft and that motor bearing. And you can just give it a little squirt down in there. And then just run that in there. Okay, so that takes care of that. Okay, so the next thing you want to work on are the worm gears. And for that, right here on top of the gear tower, there is this plastic uh, structure. And all you have to do is take a screwdriver and put it under the bottom of it and give it a little bit of a wedge and lever it back up here like so. Okay, so that one popped up real nice. So what we have here then, let's go in again. What we, have again, what we have here is this worm gear, and you can see these bearings. So you could actually, if you can get that worm gear off, and I'll show you an alternative in a minute to what I'm going to show you here, you can just oil these bearings right here like this, and then put a little bit of, the, of this white grease, And what I'm using here is Hobby Lube HL657 white grease. It's plastic compatible, contains Teflon, and it's made for this kind of operation. So get a little bit of that in there and turn your, turn your flywheels, and that's going to distribute that grease for you in there. So it gives you a nice coating of Teflon grease in there and it's going to keep it turning. You won't get any freeze ups or anything. No binds. Get that in there and then just pop this guy back in place. There you go. So that's pretty easy, straightforward way of doing that. Right here, this is the Atlas locomotive again. You can see we've got another bearing right here on the end. Just the same way. You want to apply just a touch of oil to it. And you can spin the flywheel to get it distributed. And also the same thing. You can see it uh, right down in here. I can actually see the bearing there. So it's easier to get to on the Atlas unit than it was to, uh, to get to it on, the, uh, on this guy. So you've got the, uh, all of these bearing surfaces here on the gear tower greased. And uh, so the next thing, while we're working on the top and have our light oil out, uh, and this is, again, a medium weight plastic compatible oil. I don't remember. This one, I think, might be made by Woodland Scenics, Hobby Lube, one of those companies. So uh, you just need to check at your hobby shop for this. Just slide the, uh, the metal dispenser needle down in here uh, to, the, uh, to the bearing and put a drop there and then put a drop here. Now, a lot of these motors nowadays 
uh, are made with uh, sealed bearings that uh, never need oiling. Uh, I never am sure, so you're not going to do any damage by putting a little drop of oil on that bearing, and you might save yourself a freeze up. And one thing, if you're ever running a locomotive and you suddenly hear a loud squeal and your locomotive comes to a stop, it's probably because either your motor bearings have seized up because they're dry, or the bearings in your gear tower have seized up uh, because they're dry. So um, check those on a regular basis, keep them oiled. Now another thing, if you cannot get to your, to your worm gear housing because it's totally enclosed in a body weight and you'd rather not take it apart, or for any other reason, you can also get to the, uh, the internal gears by popping these cover plates off on the bottom. And just about all of these locomotives have some sort of cover plate like that. This is an Atlas one right here. These are very difficult to get off, and I'll show you what I do in that case. Uh, but on these here, uh, they're fairly easy to pop off. This is the Atherin again, and it's the same for the lifelike. You just take a number 11 knife blade and slide it under the edge of this cover plate here and lever it up and it will pop up and do it at both ends and you will be able to get the little cover plate to pop off. I'm not going to try it now because it uh, takes a couple of minutes to do it. So basically then this comes off giving you access to your gears and then you can just squeeze some of this hobby lube grease down in here and using the uh, flywheels just rotate those gears and it will distribute that grease throughout the entire gear train, including up into the gear tower and lubricate that uh, worm gear up there for you. So you just keep moving that around or just leave it and uh, pop the uh, cover plate back on at that point to hold everything in place. Okay, there. So that's all it takes to get that lubricate. Do that for both sets of trucks on these. And this works with most types of, of locomotives. Now, as I said, it can be very difficult on some of these Atlas models to get these apart. What you want to do is, if you look here on the top of the, uh, the truck here, right on the top of the worm gear housing, there's an opening right here. All you have to do is take and put your tube right there and squeeze some lube in there. So you can see that and then as the uh, motor turns, the flywheel turns, that's going to distribute that lubrication all down through the gears. So that's how you go about it with some types of locomotives, that it's very difficult to get that bottom plate off. And it's very easy to break this if you don't do it correctly. But uh, like I said, I try never to get these apart. It's very easy to break them. It's easier to just do it this way. Okay, we're coming to the home stretch on this. now. Another thing that is important is here on the uh, underside of the truck. And you will see that right here uh, on each axle, there are two bearings just the same. There are these bronze bearings. Put a drop of oil right on the back, right here on each one of these, between it and the uh, actual wheel. And give that a spin. Get those wheels moving. And what will happen is the oil gets down in there and can slowly be released over time. And that allows it to uh, basically be self-oiling. So if you periodically replenish that oil supply for it, uh, they'll be able to keep operating for years without seizing up on you. So you just want to do that and then spin that uh, axle Spin those axles by turning the motor, and that will distribute the oil for you and work it in there. And of course, the more you run it, uh, it's, I, I recommend running these right after you do all of this work. Okay, so that gets that done. And it's the same thing here. You can see, uh, basically, these lifelike units, they all have these same type of bearings. Here, I showed you these before on the ends here. The motor bearings, they're easy to get to because there's a little bit more space in here. Between the, uh, between the flywheel and the motor itself. So it's very easy to get your uh, dispenser needle down in here. Okay, so there, that gets that oiled. Okay, finally, this is step number 10. 
This one, we're going to take a look right here. It's what's called the commutator plates. Now, the commutators are these little contacts right here, and they are in contact with the uh, motor brushes. And that's what uh, makes the contact between the two polarities and makes the motor turn around. So you need to look into motor theory to fully understand what they do. However, the important thing, the, uh, the uh, brushes themselves, I believe, are hardened graphite or something of that nature, and they rub up against these commutator plates all the time as the motor is spinning. And what happens is they build up this carbon deposit on the surface of the commutator plates, and that needs to periodically be cleaned off. Now, one way you can do that is clean it with a little alcohol or just use a Q-tip like this one, cotton tip, and get down in there and clean it. And you can see it can be very difficult to clean these. So what do I recommend for cleaning that? Well, you can get some kinds of solvent and put them on here and try to just rub it off. Uh, it can be very difficult to do that though. What I do is I picked up a can of this CRC QD contact cleaner. QD means it's quick dry. It's plastic safe, and that's important when you're dealing with your models. And then this stuff, it's made for doing this job, so I'm not afraid of it. I'm not gonna use it in the room here. And you can just spray this in here all over that, uh, all over that uh, commutator plates and give them a turn and let that stuff just flow through there. And it will start coming out of there black. And then when you're done, that's gonna be nice and shiny uh, like these flywheels here. You can see here on uh, this particular Athern locomotive, the, uh, it's much, much cleaner, but it still could use some cleaning as well. With some uh, locomotive motors, it's almost impossible uh, to get to them because they're enclosed. However, if you look real hard, you can find an opening like this one right here where you can insert this little tube and give it a blast and turn that and, and uh, get it cleaned out because I had a Bachmann uh, locomotive and it did not run worth a darn. I took this stuff and went out into the, gr into the driveway, stuck the uh, tip into the hole just like this, and it looked, the motor was very similar to this one in that respect, and just gave it a blast. And I kept doing that until uh, it's, it, it initially it was coming out black. And finally, after it had cleaned itself quite a bit, uh, it came out nice and clean. And that's when you know you're done. So you might, you know, it might take a couple of minutes of blasting with this uh, cleaner to get it to, uh, to clean all of that gunk that's built up on those uh, motor plates, com commutator plates, but it will come clean. And if you've got a really uh, bulky motor and you're afraid you're gonna have to replace it, uh, try doing something like this first. And make sure you get something that is a plastic compatible uh, cleaner like this for, co for electrical contacts. And CRC makes a lot of different versions of this, so make sure that you look uh, at what they have on their website. Okay, so that's my 10 easy steps. I'm gonna put a list of these on in the description for you guys so you can see what I, uh, what I covered and be reminded of what these 10 steps were without having to rewatch re the entire video. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. Uh, I really uh, recommend that you begin your own regular maintenance program and keep pretty good notes on each locomotive because I'm sure that there are a lot of locomotives that you have in your fleet that get used on a regular basis. And then there's some that only get used irregularly or very little at all uh, during operating sessions and the like. So you need to keep track of how much use each gets and adjust your maintenance schedule accordingly because those that get regular use and run up a lot of mileage are the ones that are gonna need regular cleaning and regular uh, lubrication. So that's it and have a great weekend. We'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guy. Bye now.